Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we are covering body acceptance, self-worth, confidence, and empowerment. Essentially, how to feel better about ourselves and our bodies. Our guest today is Erica Mather. Erica is a lifelong teacher who has struggled with emotional eating, compulsive over-exercising, and body dysmorphic disorder. As an embodiment educator, she guides people to feel better in and about their bodies. Her Adore Your Body transformational programs help overcome body image challenges and the Yoga Clinic of New York City helps students, teachers, and health professionals to learn about empowered self-care for the body. Hello, Erica. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Oh my gosh, what an exciting day we've had together I know. already, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> we've done a lot of tech support for those of you just listening in, but it's it's okay. We've made it and we're here. We're using Zoom today, which is fine. Um, so Erica, why don't you start by telling us your message and the story on why you became so passionate about what you shared today? Yeah, so... I want people to feel better in and about their body. That's basically what I do. So I help people overcome body image challenges, but I also am a yoga therapist. And so I really deal with sort of what we call, I guess, boots on the ground, kind of like the realities of how you feel in your body from day to day. And I got here because I felt very alienated from my own body. I had, in my 20s, I had emotional eating problems. I had over-exercising issues, sort of subclinical body dysmorphia. And through yoga, I learned how to come into a different relationship with my body. And I really feel like this is critical for modernity. It's critical for so many issues, including like eating disorders and identity issues and work-life balance. And how are you going to spend your life this one precious life you have. So I feel like the uh, the message of embodiment can reach a lot of different people with a lot of different kinds of problems. Yeah, I love this message too. I want to know like, what was the turning point? Was there like a catalyst? Because you mentioned you had all these struggles with your body before and what, you know, what created that shift to the mindset you have now? I started to have adult onset migraine headaches in my 20s. And so that was a real wake up call. I feel like a lot of times the materialization of a chronic illness of some sort or an acute illness of some sort is kind of like your body being like, so you've really abused me for a long time and here's the bill. And so that was really when things started to change for me. And as a result of having this crisis, which I still live with today, but as a result of the materialization of this crisis, I, I found yoga and it was at yoga that I started to realize like, oh, I'm really cruel to myself and I'm very vicious with my own body. No wonder I'm sick. And I feel like a lot of people will have those sorts of clarion calls And sometimes we pay attention and sometimes we don't. And how you handle that really will set the course for the rest of your life and your your health, which is your most precious possession is your health and and how you experience your life on a day-to-day basis. It's very hard to have a great experience of life if you are sick every day. And, And I have friends who have legit like, terminal chronic illnesses. And I'm always in admiration of them for how they really manage that reality and find a way to live joyfully. Those of us who aren't living with those sorts of things, I think that we take it for granted and we suffer a lot as a result. Yeah. I mean, so you basically, that catalyst was the migraines. And then is that how you began to go into yoga? So tell me about your journey, this transformation. It's been long (laughs) and it's ongoing. It's it's never done. It's never done. As a matter of fact, I'm leading a program starting this Sunday, which is about 
uh, life purpose and what are we here to do anyway and utilizing our bodies as an ally in this in this quest and that's 20 years later you know mm. I, I started having migraines in my 20s I'm 47 just to to like help contextualize um so it's been 20 years that this has been this has been happening and so I just want to put that in perspective for listeners like it's not like but boom, boom it's done it's a, it's an ongoing journey but I think if I had to say the very first piece was realizing that my body and my body encompassing my face was and is useful for things other than work, other people's pleasure, the approval of other people, and that that actually my body is mine. Mm-hmm which seems like it should be very simple to wrap your head around, but I feel like there are lots of very powerful, very quiet messages that teach us that our bodies aren't ours. And so really claiming my body as mine for my own pleasure, for my own joy, for my own usefulness was sort of the beginnings of that. And then it was oh, well, this, if this is mine, then perhaps I should stop abusing it mm-hmm. for the usefulness of other people, for the pleasure of other people. And a lot of other things then spill forth from that. Um, a different relationship with work, a different relationship with rest, a different relationship with attractiveness of myself or what kind of a partner I'm attracted to. When you start thinking differently about yourself, It also changes how you think about other people. And then when you start thinking about other people differently, it starts to change how you think about yourself. So the beginnings of that, I think, was about sort of a a word that's in a lot of circulation, I feel like right now, is sovereignty. I wouldn't have called it sovereignty back then, but now people are calling this sovereignty. This is my domain. Mm -hmm. My body is my domain. I am the queen of my domain. I get to decide who gets to come in and who gets to stay out, you know? Right. I love that. It's like a very, it's a shift in how you look at yourself that changed everything else. Uh, And it's, I can see how that can be so powerful. Let's talk about, um, I guess the, the, you know, the source of the problem, like what, why we see our bodies as not belonging to ours. Like, oh, we're trying to look good for other people, trying to get approval from others. Like if, you know, wh- why don't we break it down to the core of like, <laughs> why are we as a society, as women, so unhappy with our bodies? I think a lot of fingers are pointed at the media and the media does have a lot to do with it. We are, uh, and media used to mean like when I was growing up, media meant like catalogs and advertising. Now media means uh, this inundation of, uh, of episodic TV, you know, it means social media. It means, um, even, even the advertising you might see in Facebook or down Mm -hmm. if, or down, um, your Google, like if you use Gmail, you get advertisements, right? It's like it advertising is everywhere now, whereas we used to be able to turn it on and off a little bit. So I I think that a lot of a lot of blame has rightfully been laid at the feet of these monoliths that create images that we feel like we can't stand up to or we can't compare to. But I'm going to actually lay the burden of responsibility at our own feet. And I think that the problem is that we don't know who we are. Mm-hmm. And when you don't know who you are, you have a very hard time identifying your own value. And the problem is that nobody can tell you who you are and what you are, except you. We spend a lot of time listening to other people, but if you, if we as women knew who we were, like I know what I bring to the situation, I know my talents, I know my skills, I know my capacities, I know my limits, I know my resources, I know who I can turn to for help, I know who's my enemy... All of these things, I think, are part of understanding who you are. 
knowing where you came from, knowing what your value is now here today. If we knew that, that then we would not hate our bodies so much and we would not be so susceptible to messaging from the outside that says that your only value lies in whether your lips are plump or not. Right. So how do you begin to have that understanding and self-awareness is I like, I, I guess there's still a disconnect in my mind is like, how do you become confident in knowing who you are? Yeah. And that is a great question. And yes, this is very slippery, very elusive. It's like, if you don't know who you are, where do you begin? Like, if you don't have confidence, how do you get a little bit of confidence? Right. And so I think, think that what you need to do, ironically, I'm going to say something that seems sort of backwards, is that you need to ask trusted sources to help reflect to you who and what you are. And trusted sources, now this is going to be very tricky. You, you're going to have to decide with trusted sources. But I think that if if someone comes back to you and says, oh, you're so pretty. Okay. Let's move along, Mm. right? Of course, we all want to feel pretty. I'm not saying that that's not it, but if that's all you got on me, that's the only reason you like me or value me, then you are not a trusted source because this is actually going to perpetuate this problem, having those people around. Today, I spoke with a friend I hadn't talked to for a long time and he reflected to me some things like, you know, that I'm strong and I'm powerful and I'm like determined and I... I am clear seeing and I'm wise and I'm earnest and I'm passionate. And just like here, I was like, oh, these are the things you want to have a trusted source reflect back to you. At no point did he say, yeah, you're pretty. And I think that your hair is really great, right? No, these are, these are potentially true things. You know, a lot of people <laughs> are like, wow, your hair is amazing. I'm always like, yes, it's just genetics. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm blessed, Right. And the world does treat me a certain way because my hair looks a certain way. But I don't want that to be the kind of world that I'm investing myself in. So if you don't feel confident, what you need to do is you need to have some trusted sources reflecting back to you things that are worthy and valuable about yourself. And then you also need to go inside of yourself and look for places where you could achieve some success even if it's the tiniest bit. This is something I love about my yoga practice that I learned from my teacher on a forest. And one of the things that she always, always, always is directing us towards is to find out what piece of this pose, this challenge, what piece of this can you do? And then to chunk it down, really chunk it down. If it's like you're trying to like, A lot of my people have problems stepping their feet forward from a down dog. Do you do yoga? Yeah, I do. Okay. So, so you can probably step your foot forward. Light is a better I got, right? (laughs) It's hard for a lot of people actually. And it's bewildering. So what's the piece of this that you could do? Could you put your knees down, put your hands on blocks and then try stepping your foot forward? Can you do it that way? So it's about constructing lessons in success, Mm. just the way that you would train a dog. You know, I think that dog training has come so far. I live in New York city. I see people with these little treat bags and they're always like rewarding their dogs and their dogs are looking to them, you know, and they're like patting and they're just rewarding them. And anytime they do something right or sometimes good, they're getting some positive feedback and we're not that different. Human beings are not that different. You need to find something, even if it's the tiniest thing that you feel like you can feel successful about, do it, do it repeatedly and reward yourself lavishly when you do. If it's just that you set your alarm, I shouldn't say just, if it is that you set your alarm and you got up like only after one snooze, which might be a huge success, that then you reward yourself in some way for having done that. Like, oh, I got up. Like, what would be a reward for you? I don't know. That's a hypothetical question or a, a rhetorical question. Right, right. But it's like, it's like you must find something, even if it's the smallest, smallest thing that you can look at and be like, I crush getting up after my second snooze today. Yeah. You're saying this helps you build confidence in yourself. You got to start somewhere. Yes. 
it, and it might be very small. I think a lot of times people fail at achieving the confidence that they would want because they shoot a little too high and then they fail and then Mm -hmm. they've, they've repeated that. Now you might have been asking me a different question. You might have been asking me the question, how do you gain confidence in your body? Was that what you were asking me? Well, you were talking about, you have to know who you are in order to feel confident in your body. Right. And so I think we're talking about self-worth and you're saying like lean into the things that are not about your appearance. It's not about how pretty you are, your hair, whatever, but lean into like, you're so strong, you're so brave, things like that, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Good summary. Good listener. (laughs) (laughs) I'm doing my best. (laughs) Okay, so you're talking about building inner confidence and a feeling of self-worth. Let's also touch on, I want you to go deeper into what you were saying, how like my body is mine and I only like, you know, I'm going to use it for my own usefulness, for my own purpose, like go deeper. Like, can you explain that and what you mean by that and how you live by that? As women, we have been taught that our body is cut up into certain pieces. It's cut up into its face, its hands, its boobs, Mm. its womb. And that those things are valuable to other people, right? They have a price tag somewhere in the world, somewhere Mm -hmm. in the universe, there's a cosmic price tag and that they're valuable to other people. So the question is, how do you reclaim all those things as yours and productive just for you or not productive for you if you don't want? So the sovereignty is a bit about like, for instance, let's take your face to begin with. Like I have a client who who one time I put on mascara and she's like, did you put on mascara? And I was like, yeah, I put on mascara. And she's like, oh, we don't need to do that to be pretty. And I was kind of like, that's very interesting, right? I get what you're saying, but also it's my face Mm -hmm. and I can do whatever the hell I want with it. Right. I can shave off my eyebrows. I can dye my hair blue. It's my face. It's my head. I will do whatever I want with it because it is mine. Mm -hmm. And you can have your opinion. But it's your opinion. Keep it right. off my body. Right. You know? <laughs> that makes right? sense. Yeah. So that's sort of what I'm saying. Will there be consequences? Absolutely. Because people will formulate opinions. They will judge you. Absolutely. There will be consequences. Let's take your hands. Your hands are kind of like what we labor with. Right now we're laboring kind of at a keyboard. You and I had a very extensive conversation <laughs> with our fingers, right? hmm But the hands are sort of like the sign of labor, but they're also a sign of love, right? So this is interesting, right? Because much labor is a labor of love. It's always done with hands, you know, sometimes with words. And so reclaiming not only your work life, which costs you your time and your time is measured in your body, Mm -hmm. right? And reclaiming your love for yourself, Right. So we've been taught that in order to pay our bills, we need to work a lot. And that is sort of a hand thing. Right. So what if we reclaimed that idea? Like, do do I really need to work a lot? What if I didn't wear myself out all the time at a laptop in a chair? So reclaiming your work life for yourself Mm -hmm. and really thinking about life. Right. This is about life. Life is measured in time and breath that you have left in your body. Most of us spend about 10 hours of our day working. So if you think about it, that's the majority of your life. You spend the other majority of your life sleeping if you're lucky, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So reclaiming the toil that you do with your hands for yourself as opposed to for someone else. Right. Do you want me to keep going? I think you're getting the idea. Yeah, it's... It's reclaiming your body for all uses, right? It's like I think it's a it's it's very empowering to to shift your mind into that space because it is true you're in control you're the boss you're in control of this body you get to do what you want to do with this body, um yeah yeah I think that's a great way to put it reclaiming yourself in all spaces because. Mm-hmm. Your body is what allows you to do everything. 
So reclaiming every area of your life, your appearance, your work life, your love life, your relationship life, your Mm. spiritual life, reclaiming those. And as these are all my domain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've been talking about that. So the appearance aspect is like, instead of changing the way you look or trying to look a certain way to impress other people, you're really, you you do whatever you want for yourself. <laughs> and it doesn't have to fit the, I think what you said earlier was funny how someone says, oh, you don't need mascara. Well, it's like, if I want to, I can. It's not about it. I think women are kind of stuck in this, um, we're we're kind of stuck in the middle sometimes whereas like we're not trying to look pretty for other people but but if we want to do it for ourselves people are like oh why are you trying why are you trying so hard or why are you like there there's there's judgment either way <laughs> whether you wear makeup or not whether yeah. you look good or not there's judgment yeah. either way <laughs> yeah. so it's it's hard to navigate as a woman so so you're saying as long as you do what you want that's all that matters yeah that is basically it. It's like, make sure you're doing it for yourself and then navigate the waters of people's judgment, mm-hmm. knowing that they will have opinions, they will judge or not judge, or they'll approve, you know? I mean, approval is a form of judgment, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and that is the consequence, whether you do it for s- someone else or whether you do it for yourself. So you might as well do it for yourself. Right. <laughs> Okay, so what is your advice? What would you say to people who are or just have trouble accepting their their body, their their image? Yeah, what I would say is you have a choice. You can go on hating yourself and bearing the burden of hating yourself, or you can dip your toe into this other realm. And the choice is really yours, right? It's up to you. There is no one who can decide to do this for you. Mm -hmm. What I chose was, it was specifically around like, it was about, I was around weight gain and weight loss. So um, I was uh, very good at restricting and became very thin and then um, had kind of like a rebound and gained like 20 pounds. And I, it sort of happened, you know, we're always a little perplexed, like what happened? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and it happened and i and i looked down the road of trying to become that thinner version of myself again and i was like down that road is misery i know what's down that road why am i choosing that road and i decided to not do anything i decided to just be uncomfortable with the way things were fitting and the way i looked because i knew that down that other road, I would never be free. Mm -hmm. Never. And so I decided, well, I know down that road, I'm never going to be free. Let me try this road and see what happens. And so to a person who is really struggling with accepting their body, first of all, it's an unfair life. We are born into a body that we did not choose. And here you are, you are plunked down onto the planet Maybe in a family, you're like, who are these crazy people? (laughs) And why do I look like this? You know, it's unfair. Yeah. But now you have a choice, which is you can go on hating the situation, hating yourself, which down that road is misery and you will never be free. Never. Or you can make a choice to be like, you know what? This isn't what I would have chosen, but this is what I've got. And I am going to make what my teacher would call a warrior's choice. So you step up to the plate and you're like, this shit is hard, but I'm going to do it. And Mm -hmm. choose, choose love. Yeah. And I know that people might be looking at us and listening to us and be like, easy for you to say a bitch, you know, (laughs) or something like that. Like you've got nice teeth and long hair. And yes, I I just want to like, I want to head that criticism off at the pass and just say like, we all got dealt the hand that we got dealt, but we all have the same choice. I'm, I'm certain that maybe, Eileen, you, and, you are sitting here having this conversation with me because maybe you have stared down the path of not liking yourself very much and made a, a choice. 
Or maybe you're in that, you're at that crossroads right now, which is maybe why we're having the conversation. So even though you're beautiful, like I'm sure that you have had some of these misconceptions about yourself. And the point is, is that no matter what body we're born into, I am very certain that almost without exception for the people who are very narcissistic and vain, that most people have looked at themselves and been like, I'm not really sure about this situation. Yeah. Like what's happening I'm here? sure everyone has had that moment. Everyone can relate to this. It's no matter how perfect you think someone is, there's a, I don't know, everyone's experienced this. So, yeah. Yep. So I love what you said. It's a choice because down this road is misery and you can continue going down that road if you want, but essentially it's a choice. Like why it's your life, your body. Why don't you at, at least try, <laughs> try another path if this, this one way has not been working for you. Yeah. And you might decide to like modify your body as best you can. And that's fine. Right. That's okay. I'm, I am not here to sit in judgment of someone deciding to get breast implants or lip mm-hmm. augmentation or whatever, or change your entire body and become a man. Like I am not here to sit in judgment of that. It is your life. It is your body. It is your soul journey. Mm-hmm. If you need to make a change in order to make it feel like you could deal with it, fine. It's yours. But like just orient yourself in that direction and find out what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Why don't you tell us more about your book, Your Body, Your Best Friend? Um, I'm curious, what's your favorite chapter? Or is there like, I don't know, like a exercise or something that you'd like to share from your book? Oh, that is a great question. What's my favorite chapter? It's like, I used to be a professional musician and I look back on the stuff that I wrote and the stuff that I recorded and was like, what's my favorite tune, you know? (laughs) Uh, What's my favorite chapter? I think that I'm really proud of chapter five, which is about confronting the hard realities of feeling unsafe in your body as a woman. Mm, Oh, and I think, you know, uh, yeah, you said, oh, like, yeah, like we know a thing or two about this, you know, Mm -hmm. and how is it that you can make your body your best friend when you don't feel safe? because you present in a way that the world has decided is not what's preferred, right? And so I think that chapter, I'm very proud of that chapter because I feel like it handled delicate issues in a graceful way that Mm -hmm. I hope really just makes every reader feel seen and held and like, oh, no one's ever talked to me about this before. And this is something that's really been troubling me and holding me back. And now I know that I could move forward. Yeah. I mean, what did you say in that chapter that you think could help? Like, give us a snippet to listeners that you think might help them hearing. As a woman who was born a woman, women are unsafe in the world, right? Being a woman is hazardous. And I think that kind of, what I was almost saying about like, it's a choice. Like, I think a lot of us alter our appearance in order to be more pleasing because we think that it will buy us safety. Mm. It won't just buy us approval or love, but it will buy us safety. If I'm pretty, people will see that I'm pretty and therefore I should be treated in a particular way. Like I'm precious or like I'm valuable, right? And maybe they won't hit me or maybe they won't take advantage of me, right? So I do feel like somewhere deep down in our female DNA and like millennium of being um, hunted and I'm going to use trigger warning language here, hunted and raped and murdered and burnt at the stake for, Mm -hmm. you know, like, like that lives on in us. And so I feel like the choice to like look down the road at your freedom or your imprisonment is also built into the realities of being a woman and to look down the path and be like, yeah, pound for pound, a man is five times stronger than me and I'm not safe, right? To really look down that path and be like, yeah, I was 
hit or harmed, right? But instead of trying, instead of blaming myself and blaming my body to really occupy my body as if it is a safe space and make it a safe space for me from the inside out, no matter what happens to me from Mm -hmm. the outside in. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a very tricky internal switch to make, just sort of like what we were talking about, like the decision to choose your freedom instead of choosing your misery. Like this is something to be like, yeah, I'm not safe. Yeah. How do you feel safe within knowing that in this world, there are like you who walk on a street somewhere and you're not safe because you're a woman. So how do you feel safe within? I think that for me personally, it's just a decision that I don't want to be controlled like Mm -hmm. that. Just like I am a little bit of a rebel archetype in a way. So I'm just like, no, you may not control me like that. Nope. Not everybody will be able to do that internal maneuvering. But I think that at least acknowledging the reality, right? Which is like in the United States, we're pretty safe for the most part. But in other regions of the world, no, right? And so that, but that is something we've lived with. So I think even just remembering that it's not it's not many generations ago that your ancestors or my ancestors were not safe is something to recall. Did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah in, in a way. I, I just think of like, there are times where I say I'm traveling alone and I don't feel safe as a woman or as a woman, like let's say you want to cover yourself up because you don't want to attract unsafe scenarios and that that's it's a reality like that's and and I see what you're saying as a woman you have to still feel you have to have that strength within to like give yourself that sense of security like I'm not going to let anyone control me um but but to me it's a I don't know there, there's still some like fine line to walk because yeah, yeah. I could say I want to wear whatever I want but if I want to protect myself I'm gonna not wear certain things if I'm by myself in certain areas so I, yeah. I'm not sure but I think that's also prudent I mm-hmm. think that's that is just prudent that is also like clear-eyed like oh I'm a woman so therefore in order to take these steps I to be safe I need to do this or that or the other right thing. right which is unfortunate that we those are steps that we have to take as a woman yeah. but it's also prudent like oh I'm going to take steps to feel safe. Right, right. I see. Yeah. And also square that away with, and I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think that it's coming with the intention, like I'm doing what's practical. I recognize the world is unfair in this way, but I'm doing what's practical. It's not out of fear necessarily. Because I think when it comes from fear, that's when it's not you know, you don't want to be in that headspace. No. So you want to come from a space where you feel secure and strong, but I'm doing this because it's practical. Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I guess we came is, to a conclusion there. Yes. That is a good uh-huh. summary. I see you're a good listener and a good <laughs> summarizer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I, I'm curious, how do you view your health now and what's your mindset or approach to health? Because you did mention you had all these, you know, yo-yo dieting, this and that. So yeah. Where are you at now with, with health, overall health? Uh, personally, I have a, I think I've repaired my relationship with food pretty conclusively. Uh, health, I think has many different aspects to it. It has your physical health, your, your mental and emotional health and your spiritual health. And so there are different silos, if you will. They're not silos. They intersect. There's different overlapping circles in a Venn diagram to comprise health. And I think also, in addition to those considerations, the most important thing is that health is comprised of what you do every day. So how are you tending to each aspect of your health every day, your emotional health, your mental health, your spiritual health, your physical health. We could go farther, but let's just leave it at those four. Mm -hmm. So 
I feel like I actually feel quite healthy. I gotta say. Um, but I'm, I'm also like, I've been at this for quite some time. I have (laughs) 20 years of, you know, since the migraine started, you know, 20 years of therapy and yoga, (laughs) I still have migraine headaches, which is unfortunate, but I do feel like I have a better sense of some of the triggers, which usually people talk about the triggers, but also migraines are just a tremendous mystery. Mm -hmm. The medical doctor, the medical community doesn't really get it. It's a little bit like, here, try this pill. Oh, well, try this other pill. Oh, well, track your triggers. My my boyfriend also has chronic migraines since 2015. So he's been to all different types of doctors, tried different types of meds. I I understand your journey. It's not easy. And it's a, it's a, it's a journey. (laughs) Yeah, it is a, it is a journey. And it's also perplexing because it is a disability. I would categorize it as a disability. When you start digging into um, the cost of migraine treatment and the deficit, like the cost upon personal economies and global economies of work lost because someone's been sick, it's it's a disability. But it's not it's not a disability like I'm using a wheelchair or mm-hmm. something that's quite visible. It's an invisible disability. And so that actually, I think, makes it much harder to explain to people because they're like, you look healthy. And I'm like, right. I'm intermittently healthy. You know? Yeah. I think I've heard people my age when I was younger say, I feel the healthiest I've ever felt. And in many ways I do. I feel stronger. I feel better rested. I feel clearer about um, my emotional life. So thanks for asking. I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> no, that's good. That's It's it's good to hear your journey because I'm sure you've been through a lot of different things and and yeah, like just, just to hear your where you are now after, after all this time. Yeah. Well, and the body image thing and the migraines thing, I, I don't think are unrelated mm. actually, because I feel like, like I said, when I came to yoga, I realized exactly how mean I was to myself, how cruel I was to myself. And the problem with like a chronic illness is like, once you open the door to that chronic illness, I think it's very hard to like close the door again, which is why I feel like, you know, if I had a message to people much younger, it'd be like, like, take your health seriously now, even though you possess your youth, because once some chronic thing crops up, it's going to be hard to get it to go away. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. And also back on the topic of you being mean to yourself, how did you stop being so mean to yourself? First of all, being mean to yourself yet rarely yields the results that you're hoping for. You notice that? Mm -hmm. Like if everybody got the results they wanted from like hating themselves and negative self-talk, like... (laughs) The world then, would be yeah, it makes sense. Place. It would work, but but it yeah. does. You're saying it doesn't. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't, doesn't get work. you anywhere. Yeah, it doesn't work, and in fact, it um it creates a deficit. You know, so I think that I wanted better for myself, and I saw that if I if you really want better for yourself, that then these sorts of habits must stop, and they're actually not productive. So again, it was like. I I guess that the theme of this particular conversation is what's the choice you're going to make? Are you going to choose the misery? Are you going to choose the self-hatred? Are you going to choose the negative self-talk? Because that doesn't actually get you anywhere. Are you going to choose the other thing? And you have a choice, which is it going to be? And so I think stopping being mean to myself also had a lot of other wrinkles to it. Like if, if you're accustomed to restricting food, like unraveling food restriction is a process and restricting is a form of violence towards yourself. Mm. And so unraveling restriction has, a, there are a lot of steps to it. There's like, oh my God, what if I gain a lot of weight? Oh my God, I have no discipline. Oh my God, um, nobody's ever going to love me. <laughs> you know, oh my God, like all of these layers to it that that are gates that a person will have to pass through. I feel like I passed through them pretty successfully on my own without like clinical care, 
But I feel like right now we exist in a time and a space where there is such tremendous clinical care from people who are um, anti-diet or or intuitive eating coaches. And, and so if anybody's listening and they're like, I don't know how you did it yourself, don't do it yourself to go get someone to help you. And there's so like, I was just interviewed a while a, a few weeks back with someone who was like, Oh my God, she just described my own experience to me with such clarity. Like, and she's like, Oh yeah, I've seen this so many times. And I was like, amazing. You know? So I was just super impressed. And I have a friend who is an intuitive eating coach and I'm super impressed by her book. You should have her on your podcast. You, and you um, can recommend like send her info to me. I will. Yeah. But on, I mean, do you have advice for listeners now who struggle with emotional overeating or restricting? I would say kind of what I'm saying right now is you don't have to sort this out on your own because mm -hmm. it is very, it's emotional. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of issues that are tied into it that are not immediately evident about self-worth. Right. And to have someone who knows a lot about it guide you skillfully through it, I think would be super, super useful. There's a, there's some great... We exist in a time and space where I think understanding about this is huge. The anti-diet movement also, I think, is quite robust at this moment. So unraveling diet culture, finding new ways to relate to food, appearance, self-worth, like mm -hmm. there are many great people and there's a lot of great books to read too. One of the books that I read way back when was called When Food is Love, written mm -hmm. by Janine Roth. And she was one of the pioneers in sort of unraveling emotional eating and restricting and binging as about like what I would call a soul wound. It's about your your soul mm -hmm. being in distress. Right. And you're using food as a way to try to cover up something. Yeah. It, it can go very deep. So, and I, I feel like everybody's relationship with food has some, I mean, there, there's always work to be done, <laughs> myself included, hearing that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, for sure. In okay. summary, you don't have to go it alone. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's reassuring. So what about your routines now? What are the things that you do regularly for self-care, take it just in general? Rest. Mm. Lots of rest. Permission to rest. This can swing in a dramatic direction for folks who are prone to depression, right? So that needs to be taken with a grain of salt. You know, if you find yourself in bed for days, that might not be the kind of rest you need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it might not be the kind of medicine you need. So the medicine is kind of like, it's tailored to the human. But mm -hmm. for me, I think restore, regenerate is really, really important. Were you the type of person that's always like active and going? Is that why? <laughs> you need to balance it out with a lot of rest. Yeah. Yeah. Like very focused on production. Yeah. That's something that I've been working on in my life is I used to be very achieving focused. And then the past couple of years is really learning to slow down and do less and rest. And, and to, to your point about like, say, if someone was depressed, there are some people that are on the other end of the spectrum where they're no energy to do anything. And so their medicine really is something opposite. It's like to find something to, to light them up again. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So again, what is medicine for me might be poison to another person. So it's yeah. very tricky, you know? Yeah. Um, I have a friend who literally like laid in bed for a year, you know, and she's just trying to like get out for a walk, mm -hmm. yeah. call a friend, not order takeout, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Small <laughs> actions just to yeah. get things moving. Yeah. Yeah. But to an earlier question about health, you know, health is what you, you do every day. So if you lie in bed every day, you will get those results. Mm -hmm. If you never rest, you will get those results, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is literally about finding the right balance for you. How much activity, how much rest, how much joy, how much pleasure, how much productivity, so that every day feels like a day that you 
are happy to live. Yeah. I love that. And you need a a little bit of everything, not too much of one thing. (laughs) You need a balance and always remember joy. Always remember sovereignty. This is your domain, (laughs) right? Um, You get to decide how you spend your day and what you do with your body and your life. Yeah. And I want to acknowledge some economic realities because I Mm -hmm. feel like probably you and I are of a socioeconomic scenario where that is easier to access right, than other right. adults. And so I just want to acknowledge that as real and true for us. And some people are working three jobs. And but even if you're working three jobs, I feel like this is a mindset that you can start to adopt. Is like I'm in production mode all the time. I need to have a moment of joy somewhere. And a lot of times unfortunately what I feel like is people turn to pills or bottles or TV to just like, to like, just rest. Mm -hmm. And you do need a rest, hopefully not like a a substance induced rest, (laughs) right? But then there also has to be something literally that is like, brings you joy. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't exist in a socioeconomic status where we like, I have, I do have a lot of sovereignty because of my socioeconomic situation which I was in part born into, but I also have crafted myself on my own through entrepreneurship. But if you are in a different scenario, like really start to think about this, like how how can you create a scenario where you every day have some balance to your day? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay, so do you have any uh, final words of advice that you'd like to leave with our listeners today? It could be around anything we talked about. (laughs) Well, I think that really what surfaced in our conversation was just about sovereignty and choice, right? It's like, where can you create agency for yourself in your own life? And it may just be around one thing. It may be around you deciding how you're going to think about your body, which is actually tremendous, right? Because you don't have to have a particular job or a particular amount of time to just shift the way you think about your body. But running underneath all that, I think, was this message, which is you can choose your misery and your prison, or you can choose your joy and your liberation and your Mm. freedom. And so whatever you do, whatever choice you do, just dig really, really, really deep and make sure that the underlying foundation and the motivation of that choice is love. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Erica. Okay, where can we find you online? You can find me at my website, ericamather.com. You can also find me mostly on Instagram. I am not on TikTok. Sorry, y'all. Um, but Instagram and then, you know, generationally appropriate a little bit on Facebook. <laughs> well, I find it to be awful and, uh, and barely on Twitter, but I'm there. I'm, yeah. I'm around on Twitter, but mostly Instagram. Right. Amazing. Thank you so much, everybody. I'll share the links down below so you can check her out. I thank you for sharing just your insight and, and reminding us that we have sovereignty over our bodies. We always have a choice. So thank you. You are welcome. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast today, Eileen. I really appreciate you. Thank you.